And today we're continuing our series, Growing Your Faith. You know, it's my hope that this series is both challenging you and deepening your relationship with God. Now, if you're new to Celebrate or you just want to know more, let me invite you to check out our webpage. We also encourage you to subscribe to our Celebrate YouTube channel. It is one of the best ways to stay connected. And if you need inspiration and encouragement throughout the week, check out my Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter accounts. Now, grab a Bible, take out your notes, and we're going to dive in. But first, I just want to talk to God. Father, what an incredible privilege we have in this time to let you speak into our lives. That, Lord, we will come out changed. That we will come out with a deeper faith and a deeper understanding of who you are. Amen. For the past three years, I've been going to college for something in the sciences. As of right now, I'm going for nursing, but that hasn't always been the case. High school was really easy for me, honestly. Academics came easy, but college is not. People always told me that college wasn't going to be easy, and they were so right. And what I found is I lost a lot of confidence going to different classes. Science classes, I felt like I was in over my head, and I was knee-deep in geniuses. I was surrounded by new people that I didn't know, and I lost some confidence that I previously had. I wasn't used to that emotion because I did feel confident in high school. So I've really been struggling with deciding what I'm going to do for my future. But what this song tells me is that I'm capable of doing that. The song you say tells me that I am loved. God tells me that I am held and God tells me that I am so strong. In my mind, sometimes I don't believe those words, but like God says, He means it. And therefore, I believe it. I trust Him. So this song reminds me that I am capable of doing everything I set my mind to. There are going to be struggles, absolutely, but push through them, and that's when the confidence is rebuilt because God is there to hold me forever. So I hope that this song can do that for you. I hope that it holds the same meaning that it does for me, and it tells you that you are strong, you are loved, and you are held. Keep fighting voices in my mind that say I'm not enough Every single lie that tells me I will never measure up Just the sum of every high and every low Remind me once again just who I am Because I need to know
Now I'm laying it at your feet You'll have every failure, God You'll have every victory Struggling to make ends meet, the pastor was livid when he confronted his wife with the receipt for a $250 dress she had recently bought. Now, I want you to picture this. You're going to appreciate this, ladies. How could you do this? He said to her, well, I was standing outside the store looking at the dress through the window, and the next thing I knew, I was trying it on. It was like Satan was whispering in my ear, you look so good in the dress. Buy it. I love what the pastor said. Well, but we talked. We talked how to deal with this kind of temptation. You're to say, get behind me, Satan. She said, I did do that. But then he said, you look good from back here, too. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to our series, Growing Your Faith. And I've entitled this weekend's message, Triumph Over Temptation. Triumph over temptation. Uh, let me just say this. Temptation is the world's oldest problem and the most common one. It just is. In fact, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, every temptation that comes our way is the kind that normally comes to all people. It's common since Adam and Eve. Are you with me on this? Temptation has been a part of the human experience. It just has. And just like last week when I made this statement, if you don't have problems, you don't have a pulse. Well, if you don't experience temptation, you're dead. Everybody will be tempted. Are you with me? Temptation is a part of our lives, but there's hope. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 that we're gonna experience temptation, here's what he goes on to say. But God keeps his promises and he will not allow us to be tempted beyond our power to resist. That's good news. He goes on to say, at the time we are tempted, God will give us the strength to endure it, and God will provide us with a way out. That's an awesome promise, isn't it? With an awesome antidote and precisely what we're going to talk about. And so if you want to have a mature faith, if you want to grow your faith the way God wants you to grow, then it is an essential that we learn how to triumph over temptation. We have to learn to triumph over temptation. So how do we do this? Well, first, we need to understand how temptation works. In fact, the Bible says this in 2 Corinthians 2.11, in order that Satan might not outwit us, we must not be unaware of his schemes. We have to be aware of how he works. We have to understand how it all comes about. In fact, someone once said, temptation is the devil's toolbox designed to break our focus. He wants us to not have a mature faith. He does not want us to grow in our faith. And so temptation is going to come. It's going to come. It's going to come. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to go to James chapter 1. Because we're going to talk about how do we overcome temptation but not only that, I think first and foremost, we need to understand how temptation works. 
And James is going to help us with this. So if you got your Bibles, James chapter 1, I'm going to begin in the 12th verse. Here's what it says. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Again, look what it says. God blesses those who patiently endure testing and temptation. Afterward, they will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. I think you could add to those who trust him, especially in times of temptation. He goes on to write, and remember, when you're being tempted, do not say God is tempting me. God is never tempted to do wrong, and he never tempts anyone else. Temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. Whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. I love those words. He chose to give birth to us by giving us his true word, and we, out of all creation, became his prized possession. Thanks be to God. So if you've got a place to write, let's talk about how temptation comes about. How does the devil work to derail us, to keep us from having a mature faith? Well, here's the first thing. He begins by using desire. He begins by using desire desire. You see, we all have them, and the devil knows it. We all have desires. And by the way, desires are not a bad thing, like the desire to eat, to drink, to sleep. It's a good thing, right? But now listen, he knows, though, when a desire is placed in a, play, in a, in a way that it's out of control, it soon will take over control. So he'll take a good thing and he can turn it into a really awful thing. Desires are not a bad thing, but that's where he starts. So he takes what seems to be a routine desire, something we naturally gravitate because God put it there, and soon he makes it a runaway desire. And now we've got a problem, right? James just told us, temptation comes from our own desires. That's where it begins. I think you'll appreciate this. I read about a guy who's trying to lose weight, but yet he shows up to the office with a box of donuts. And of course, his coworker, who knew his weight issue, said, why would you get a box of donuts since you're trying to lose weight? Here's what the man said. He said, I came to the corner where the donut shop was. And so I asked God, if you don't want me to buy a box of donuts, don't let there be a front door parking spot. And yet God answered my prayer. On the eighth time around the block, there was a front door (laughs) parking spot. There lies the problem. So he starts with desire, right? But then he brings about the deception. Let me just say it this way. The donut shop isn't the problem. With me? Talking to God wasn't the problem. The problem was when he turned on the turn signal and decided to go around the block. Now we've got a problem. Now we've got a runaway desire. And therein lies the deception. See, the donut is a want, but it's not a need. Deception happens when we make it a need. And therein lies the problem. Verse 14, James says this, temptation comes from our own desires. But now watch which entice us and drag us away. It entices us. And therein lies the problem. See, Satan knows our hot buttons, don't he? He knows our weaknesses. He knows us inside and out. He knows what turns us on and he knows what turns us off. And he's constantly hitting the switch, if you will. It's like the woman who was swimming in the Gulf of Mexico. She was enjoying an afternoon relaxing on her new inflatable raft. 
But then she realized that she'd been swept out to sea and she began to scream for help, but no one could hear her. When the Coast Guard finally caught up with her, she was five miles from the shoreline where she first entered the water. Now, here's the deal, and I don't want you to miss it. She didn't see the danger when she got into the water and she got relaxed. But the danger happened when she finally got to a place that was beyond her control. And that's what Satan wants to do. He wants us to enjoy relaxing. It's just a desire. It's just a box of donuts. It's not that big a deal. It's just one good look. And then the glance turns into a gaze, and now the issues start. By the way, if you want to write something down, the words entice and drag are key words. The word entice is a fisherman's term, meaning to be lured. In fishing, they'll use lures. They use bait, right? Certain different baits to try to catch the fish. The word drag is a hunter's term, meaning to be snared in a trap. And so notice what the devil does. He takes a desire and then he starts to kind of play with it. Get it on the hook and, and like, or like a hunter, hide the trap. And then you get off the beaten path and all of a sudden you're caught. And that's where the deception comes in. So he begins with desire. Something is healthy and is natural. But then he starts to deceive us. It's just one donut and now it's a box of donuts. But then brings about disobedience. That's the third thing he does. That's what James writes. Then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. I like to say it this way. Whatever you flirt with, you will eventually fall for. Whatever you flirt with, you'll eventually fall for. I said it a moment ago. It's not the glance that's the problem. It's when it becomes the gaze. Or as the old adage goes, if you play with fire, you get burned. And that's where our problems begin. And now sin is underway. By the way, this is really what's behind all the advertisement that goes on. When you see an advertisement on television and all that stuff that happens, their whole goal is to get you to turn a glance into a gaze. And then you start to entertain it and thinking, well, I've got to have it, that you eventually go out and buy it. So they play it in such a way that it looks so good. And by the way, have you ever, ever, ever had that happen where it looked so good until you opened up the box when you got it at your house? It was, it was just not the same thing. You with me on that? But that's how the devil works. Because the devil knows this. Watch this. If he can get your attention, he will eventually move you to action. And then the final step is, from desire to deception to disobedience, is death. And that's what James says. When sin is full grown, it gives birth to death. Now, I want to pause there for a moment, and let's just talk about this, because there's incredible hope. Because I want, I want to go back to what James said, because that's what we're going to look at. And how do we overcome temptation? But let's just talk about it. What's going through your mind? First thing I think about is it's really important that I am aware of what those desires are, that I'm aware of what are those, what are those things that I know that Satan wants to tempt me with, because that gives me an upper hand on being able to control that as best I possibly can, putting guardrails up, talking with others about it so that others can help me. So being aware and knowing what those desires are. I think is really important. And the desires are not, well, my desires are probably not the same desires as Amy's. And they can even be things as desiring people's attention and those kinds of things or um, temptation to worry and to fear and just kind of let yourself get down or whatever. Even, even those kinds of things are temptations because that's not where God wants us to be. Anywhere that God doesn't want us to be is a temptation. I think about the comparison, you know, just of 
the desires of the flesh and the desires of the spirit. If you look at what the desires of the spirit are going to want for us is we're going to want to grow in our relationship with the Lord. When you look at the desires of the flesh, it's going to want to break that relationship apart that you have with the Lord. And the enemy is going to pull stronger on those. You know, we have to remember that there's a spiritual war going on. And we, we, I think we can easily lose sight of that. And I would say the most dangerous thing is as Christians, when we grow numb to that, we get so wrapped up into worldly living, we forget that there's a battle going on that's waging over our soul. And, and, and yet people get caught up in that. And I think it's one of those things where we get numb to the desires. It's just part of it. I've heard Christians say it, you know, well, we, we all make mistakes. As if that's the justification. The cross was to remove those mistakes and, and that we'd start living according to the spirit and there'd be a different desire. We, as humans, we love power phrases like, I'm strong, I am confident, I'm you know, powerful, all those kinds of things. Well, in Christ, yes, but outside Christ, no. I love the analogy of the lured, ensnared, because if you've ever been around a situation where you've trapped something, like I, we had squirrels at our previous house, they're just causing havoc. So I put out a trap, Sure enough, there are two squirrels around there, and one of them went in, caught him, great. The other squirrel was trying to do everything he could to get him out. Well, obviously he couldn't. So I took the squirrel, brought him out of town, released, brought the cage back. Five minutes later, the second squirrel's back in there. And I thought, isn't that human nature? Because we think, well, that'll never happen to me. I'm strong. I'm powerful. That, that would never happen to me. No, we are weak. <laughs> and if we get close enough, it'll happen. I don't care to anyone else. And playing with the squirrel analogy, can I just say this? We're all nuts. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about us? It's so true. Well, that'll never happen to me. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I think it's exactly what the devil wants us to say. Yeah. He's like, oh, this will be an easy one. Here comes the trap. It's just nuts. <laughs> We're nuts. I feel that we talk about it because we balance persistency. Um, we are persistent towards something that might be, uh, it's a desire that might be necessary, but the, I think it's quantifying something. When you ta talk about <clears throat> how much you want something, if you're, if you're being persistent over, over and over again, eventually, um, that might outdo you because that, that, um, the thing that you desire is stronger than yourself. So us constantly going back to that thing that we had used, like you said, donuts, um, you going back to that, it's not that one of the donuts is going to cause you harm, but it's bec it becomes a habit. I feel my, my, my mantra is everything must be done in moderation because anything done in excess will kill you. Yeah. That's good. And so the process of how Satan works, he takes a desire, he deceives us with it. Now comes the disobedience and then the death. But I told you there's good news. Look what James writes in verse 12. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. For when he is tried, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to them that love him. Blessed is the man who endures, who endures. So how do we handle temptation? How do we learn to say no in a world that's trying as hard as it can to get us to say yes? Well, here's step one. You have to be realistic. It's just another way of saying what Chris just said a moment ago. You have to be realistic. You're going to be tempted. You're going to be tempted. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when. Paul wrote that in 1 Corinthians. Again, no temptation has seized us that is not common. What does he mean by that? Everybody's going to be tempted. Red, yellow, black, or white, you're going to be tempted day and night. Okay? You're going to go through temptation. So you have to be realistic about it. You have to know you're never going to be numb to it. You're never going to escape it. It's going to happen. So we roll our shoulders back, right? And we go, okay, we're going to experience what everybody else experienced. The devil's going to try to derail us. So we're realistic about it. But here's step two. And this is when it starts to pick up a little bit. Step two. 
you have to then take responsibility. Will Rogers said it this way, the American history can be divided into two great movements, the passing of the buffalo and the passing of the buck. And boy, is that true. The devil made me do it. Have you ever heard those words? The devil didn't make you do nothing. The devil just stuck the carrot out there. You're the one that took the carrot. The devil gets blamed for so much. And then when something bad happens to the Christian, we like to go, well, where was God? Why would God cause this? We, we just, in that moment, you're not being realistic. Bad things happen to God's people as they do to people who aren't God's people. But temptation comes to God's people as it does to people who aren't of God. It's gonna happen. You know, I read about a mother who told her son not to go swimming. Some of you mothers might relate to this. However, when he came home, she noticed that his hair and bathing suit were wet. Well, I told you not to go swimming. She scolded him. Well, I couldn't help it, Mom, he defended himself. The water looks so good. But why did you take your bathing suit with you? Well, just in case I was tempted. And how many times has that happened? See, if you truly want to overcome, rather than being overcame by temptation, it's imperative that you understand what it means to take responsibility for your life. Now, we're going to talk about how you do this, but I think Chris really said it best, being very aware of your desires, very aware of where your weaknesses are, very aware of your vulnerabilities. It's so important. We need to be realistic. We're going to be tempted, right? But then we have to take responsibility. Now, here's the key to responsibility. Step three, be prepared. It's preparation. Peter tells us, be on your guard. Jesus said, watch and pray that you will not enter into temptation. Paul wrote, put on the whole armor of God so you can stand against the attacks of the evil one. James said in verse 14, each one is tempted when by his own evil desires he is dragged away and enticed. But then he says this, but don't be deceived. What's he saying? Be prepared. It's going to happen. Be realistic. Take responsibility. But you need to be prepared. Uh, let me just say it this way. Winners do daily. We've said it before. What losers do occasionally. Winners do daily. What losers do occasionally. If you want to have a growing faith, if you want to have a mature faith, you can never undervalue the daily need to be in God's word and to study it. You can never undervalue the daily need to spend time in conversation and prayer with God. Because your daily diet will always become your momentary declarations. Let me just say it again. Your daily diets will always become your momentary declarations. When temptation comes, whatever you've been doing daily, that's about all you've got in facing that temptation. And I think it comes back to awareness. It's not only that I need to know where I'm vulnerable and where I'm weak. I better make sure that I'm doing the daily things every day. As the old adage goes, practice makes perfect. Let me just say another way of saying this. Sin, sin never just happens. Sin never just happens. It happens because of your lack of preparation. Let's talk about it. What's going through your mind thus far? I know people in the medical profession like we all do, and in sometimes conversations with them, uh, especially people who are in surgery or people that work in that way, the people that they would say that have the best recovery times or the best uh, you know, benefits out of that surgery are the ones who coming in were the healthiest. They had already had nutrition, proper nutrition, they had exercise was a part of their program. And even after surgery, they bounce back so much quicker. The ones that don't took so much longer. So when you talk about that whole aspect of being prepared, I think that's why I like, for example, memorizing scripture, not just reading it, but memorizing it and putting it. I, there were times in my life when I was trying to 
work through obviously addiction stuff, I would take cards, three by five cards of scripture memory, and I just put them all different places. So I was constantly meditating them over and over and over again, putting in, so it wasn't something I just read, it was something that was inside of me. I, like, I equate it like what I think about, like if I have a temptation, like I think about, this was over a year ago now too, but you know, something as simple as drinking pop. Um, I didn't drink like tons of it, but it was too much. And I went for a period of probably two months of absolutely none, constantly just drinking water or something that was unsweetened. But I can't remember what they say that time, like if you wanna to try to break a habit, it takes 30 days or 60 days or whatever that is. But it's true because if you can really, if you can daily um, really work on that on a daily basis, I would say now, I, I drink a pop maybe once every two weeks, and it, obviously it's under control, but I don't have, I, I do not have that desire. That desire is, is almost gone, um, but, it's, but, it, but you have to have a daily habit um, to work that out. And after, you know, it took me 60 days, but um, it's, 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 it's definitely workable now. I like that perspective. I, I didn't even think about that because I've, I've done that with food too, you know, not as many sweets because I love sweets and all that. And, and my desire has been changing with that. But I didn't put it together in my spiritual life. Like thought patterns and stuff that I've had for so long that have kind of almost overtaken my life. But that I could do the same thing with that as... I do with the food. So I'm going to have to process this now, but I like that, that perspective, and I, I want to try that. I, I was in the hospital this week uh, having a r routine procedure, and uh, they were asking me questions uh, because uh, uh, about four months ago I went into my doctor and just had that checkup. I wanted to see how I was doing with my health, and my blood pressure was too high. And, and uh, believe it or not, there's no diabet you know, diabetes in our family but I, I was like 0.1% like away from all of a sudden being a diabetic. And it, that was alarming to me. And so he put me on a prescription and uh, I, I've yet to pick it up. Now, partly because being an athlete, I instantly knew how I'd gotten to where I'd gotten. I really enjoyed Christmas, you know, with all the chocolates and that stuff. And it wasn't just Christmas Day. I, I enjoyed Christmas starting in the fall, uh, building <laughs> towards it. And uh, so when I went in, it was not good. Uh, and I knew I was in trouble. And I was, I was probably 10 pounds overweight. And, uh, and so he said, you really need to take this. But I chose not to out of my own frustration as I knew how I got here. But being an athlete, I knew how to reverse that. But so I was ask, answering the question, and they said, how long have you been taking it? And I said, well, I haven't taken any of it. And uh, in fact, I didn't even pick it up. And I thought it was interesting what the nurse said. I barely got those words out, and she, under her breath, she goes, typical. And I thought about that. It hit me so hard. And, and I only say that to say this. How many of us have claimed to be Christian and yet we're not living really a disciplined Christian life and the unsaved world goes, typical. God gives us medicine. He gives us a prescription. And that prescription has to be daily, if you will, taken if we're going to be spiritually healthy. And yet how many of us, when it comes to temptation, read what you said, you know, that won't happen to me. And, and if I could say something, if you could hear this, boy, if you could grab a hold, I'm going to tell you something the Bible says. It happens to everyone. We've all sinned and fallen short. The Bible says the human heart is wicked if you can truly understand it. We all need the daily prescription from Dr. Jesus if we're going to get spiritually in shape, and if we're going to overcome temptation, we're going to need the victorious one who overcame the evil one. Amen to that? We need to be prepared. And preparation means that, that it isn't about game time. It's about what people don't see. 
It's daily picking up the basketball and practicing the shot, picking up the Bible and reading it and applying it. So it's not that the scripture, if you will, comes alive in the midst of temptation uh, because now we need it. When it's in here, it's always alive. That's how we overcome. It's about preparation. But then it brings us to step four. Stay focused. Or as the great prophet, <laughs> you know, the Grinch, stay focused. You know, it's, it's one of my favorite lines in, this, in that movie. Uh, in fact, here's what James says in verse 17. Every good, don't miss this, every good and perfect gift, gift is from above. Coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. What in the world is James talking about? How, how do you connect, stay focused? Well, here's the deal. Everything God gives us is good. Remember I talked about those desires that we have are very human and very normal. It's a part of the creation. But whatever has your attention has you. Are you going to focus on the desire or the one who gave the desire? Are you going to focus on, if you will, uh, those appetites that you have or the source of all those appetites? You see, that's what James is talking about. Everything God gives us is perfect. It's good. Those things are coming down from heaven. And so what are you going to choose to focus on? This is why Paul tells us in 1 Thessalonians, keep away from every kind of evil. When Satan wants us to take another trip around the block. <laughs> in fact, Timothy, or Paul wrote Timothy these words, run from anything that stimulates youthful lusts. He goes on and, and says, instead, pursue righteous living, faithfulness, love, and peace. Enjoy the companionship of those who call on the Lord with pure hearts. If I could say this, sometimes we need to run from things, right? The Bible says flee sexual immorality. But when you run from something, don't leave a forwarding address, okay? Don't tell them where you're running to. Okay. Are you with me on that? But it's not just running from it, if we're going to understand temptation. It's also who are we running to? And what are we running to? Every good and perfect gift comes from God. I want to run to him. That's what it means to stay focused. Stay focused. By the way, Chapman says it this way. My life is governed by this one rule. Listen to this. Anything that dims my vision of Christ, anything that takes away my taste for the Bible, anything that cramps my prayer life or makes my Christian worth difficult for me, I must as a child of God, turn away from it. Those are good words. Those are great words. And so we have to be realistic. We're going to be tempted, right? But then we have to take responsibility. And that responsibility is what? Prayer. Being in the Word. Daily exercising and being with our, our God. And growing that relationship. And by doing that, we have to stay focused. Keep our eyes. Isn't that what Jesus said? The eyes are the lamp of the body. What you choose to look at, it's, it, that's what's going to come out. And I have to stay focused on my God. Well, what's going through your heart and mind before we wrap this up? I don't know about your cell phones, but I got a call the other day, and the word on it said possible spam. I don't know if you have that, but that's what it said, possible spam. Well, of course, I'm not going to answer it if it's a possible spam. Or sometimes if it's, an, if it's a number you don't know, you don't, don't always answer. And I thought, man, isn't it like temptation? You know, if we could know, hey, that's a, that's a possible temptation. That's a possible temptation. Wouldn't it be nice if we could know that? Well, we can because the Bible says it. It says whatever is honorable, right, true, pure, those kind of things. Think on those things. And it says if it's not, then Paul says take every thought captive. He said, nope. That's not a true and honorable thought. I'm not, I'm not going to go on that one. Nope, I'm going to grab it right away. That's part of being prepared, but then it's staying focused. I'm going to stay focused on what thoughts go through. Nope, that's a possible thing. I'm not going there. Not going to do it. And I thought, God's Word gives us that, that ability to do that. 
are we completely willing to break away from every potential, those things that we're aware of, those desires that we're aware of? Are we, compl- are we willing to completely, you know, not leave a little thread of a way that I could pull myself back to that desire at any point in time? For me, I, I just think I have to completely do away with every potential little thread that would get me back to that desire. Um, that's, that's being prepared and taking responsibility. For me, um, that's what I have to do. I have to cut it, cut it completely off. Being prepared with scripture is one of the things that's the best for me, just because it goes back to taking our thoughts captive. You know, we get those feelings of anxiety and nervousness or whatever it may be, and I have to remember in my heart, I'm prepared with God's scripture already. I have that. That's part of me. It's built into me. It's built in my head. And that should be what gives us the opportunity to take those thoughts captive. If we've been kind of feeding the same desire for a long time, we're comfortable there. Mm -hmm. And it's almost scary to let it go, even though you know you'll be a better person when you do. But just, I guess, just um, trusting in God and who he is to just let it go and then trust that he'll bring you to the place through his word and faith in his word and memorizing. I really agree that memorizing scripture is really awesome because you're always going to have those moments you never expect. And then the Holy Spirit just brings that verse to your mind. And then you have a choice to either grab onto it in faith and overcome those thoughts or whatever, or, you know, turn away from it. But when you have it memorized, the Holy Spirit will bring it to mind. I want to add just one little point here when we talk about staying focused, because I think that if I don't add this, there would be a grave danger that I think that Satan loves to do with temptation is to isolate. Probably the most important thing that I could give you about staying focused is the necessity and understanding a life group, having people around you. I say it all the time, and it's sort of joking, but it's also very real. If you want to fly with the eagles, you got to quit running with the turkeys. And yet so many people think they can keep one foot in their worldly relationships and somehow it's going to still free them to walk in godly ones. And it doesn't work that way. Paul tells us, be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. What's he talking about? He's talking about, you know, if you take two bulls or two bison or two donkeys, they put a yoke on them and that they're side by side, which means you can never get away. You think you can. And and it won't work that way. Paul's literally telling us, you need to come out from underneath that. I have no if you will, relationships with an unsaved person where I've given them the keys to my heart. I'm even careful about God's children with that. But to have people around you that truly have God's best for your life, you need to ask yourself that. Do the friends I associate with really have God's highest intention for me? Like when I'm at my worst, they're going to still be at their best. When everybody else is checking out, throwing rocks, they're always checking in and helping, if you will, soothe out the pain and the hurt. I want people like that. I want people who talk God's word with me. People that truly want to pray with me, who are in the battle with me. I had a conversation this week with someone that's just succumbed to temptation over and over and over and over again. Well, as we started asking, who are you hanging around with? Who are you spending time with? What do they do? Well, that's what the case is. We said, okay, you have to, what you said, you have to cut off every thread of that. You have to delete them. You have to get a different job because some of those were in the workplace. You got to get a different job, different phone number. I mean, you have to treat it that way because if not, it's kind of like a cancer. Well, we'll just take out part of the cancer. No, you have to cut it all out. Otherwise, it's going to keep spreading. You're exactly right. Life groups are one of the best guardrails that you can, you know, put in your life. They're, all those people are there to hold you accountable and they become family. So they're just going to build you up. 
You know, I've got to have friends that have eternity in mind. If a person doesn't know Christ, I'm not trying to say that to sound judgmental or mean. I just know that whatever I'm going through, they can't see beyond planet Earth. They always see in the moment. And, and that's the best that they can provide for me. But I want someone who has my salvation Absolutely. always in their care. And, and those are the people that, that really are fighting for you. Yeah, you can't do it by yourself. Absolutely not. I definitely see the application of, of life groups uh, because it's a way for it to measure what's going on in your life, your active life. And so as you're reflecting on God's word, and what you're supposed to, or challenged to do, you want to make sure it's applicable to your situation. And so when you're in a life group, those people would be helping you stay accountable to the things that you guys are learning. And that's why I feel that it is a very, very useful tool. Well, here's the final step, Jesus. That is the final thing that I want you to catch in all of this. That's step five. I share with you out of 1 Corinthians 10 about when it comes to temptation. I want to read it again. God is faithful. There's the key. It's God. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. He will not. Paul goes on to write, but when you're tempted, he will provide a way out so you can stand up under it. And that's what Jesus said, wherever your treasure is, there your heart will be also. When it comes to temptation, this isn't the issue, this is. Who has control of that? See, the single most important principle in overcoming temptation is Jesus. Or another way to say it is this, whoever is behind the wheel is in control. Who's ever driving the car? They're driving the car. Who is it? Who is it? You need to know Jesus will never be the passenger. By the way, not trying to be funny, but if you ever seen me drive, there ain't no way he would ever be the passenger. I'm just telling you, uh, we'd, be in, we'd be in serious trouble. But how many of our lives, we somehow, we're somehow content thinking he's in the car? And I am committed to believe he's only in the car when he's driving the car. I won't have another God before me. We don't get to. See, if we want to win over temptation, then we have to let God be our transformation. By the renewing of our mind and all of that preparation that we're realistic about the fact I'm going to be tempted. And I'm going to take responsibility. It is my life and those things are going to come and I need to make sure that I'm responsible. And I do that by daily exercising, you know, in God's word, doing the right stuff, what winners do daily. I'm not going to do occasionally. And then I'm going to stay focused, but I'm going to need others to help me in that. Other godly people helping me with that. But it all comes down to this. Is Jesus in control? Is Jesus in control? And I want to pray right now because if he's not, it can start today. You want to win over temptation? You want to triumph over temptation? Well, it begins with having a relationship with Jesus. And maybe you need to just rekindle that and, and just refocus that and repent to God that, that you haven't been walking the way you've needed to walk and, and reconfess that. So let's pray right now. Father, all of those who are watching, I'm praying right now that in the true depth of their heart, they really want to triumph over temptation. God, they want to have victory in Jesus, and that's the key. It has to be in Jesus. God, you're not a passenger in some sidecar. You're the one behind the wheel that wants to take us to where you want us to go, to have a mature, growing faith, to be deep, that God, when we go through the difficulty and temptations come our way, we will be victorious because our victor victory is in Jesus. 
So I just pray right now for those who just need to confess that they just repeat after me, Father, forgive me. Forgive me for thinking I can do it on my own, in my own strength, in my own way, in my own authority. God, I repent of that right now. I need you. I need Jesus. God, I don't understand it all, but one thing is crystal clear. You died for me to set me free from me and that I could triumph over temptation. And so I surrender right now to you. And God, it's not gonna stop there. I'm gonna be tempted. The devil's gonna try to derail me. He doesn't want me to have a mature faith, but I'm taking responsibility to daily be in your word. As David said, I hide the word in my heart that I would never sin against it. Over and over, this Bible speaks of the power of your word. God, I'm gonna get into a life group. I need other brothers and sisters who will help me grow. God, I'm gonna focus on you because there's victory in Jesus. Amen. Amen. God bless. You were the word at the beginning. One with God, the Lord most high. Your hidden glory in creation. And I revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us So Jesus, you brought heaven down My sin was great and love was greater What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is what a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus Christ, my King What a wonderful name it is And nothing compares to this What a wonderful name it is The name of Jesus What a wonderful name it is
imagine What a powerful name it is And nothing can stay against What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus You have no rival You have no equal Now and forever God you reign Yours is the kingdom Yours is the glory Yours is the name above all names What a powerful name it is What a powerful name it is The name of Jesus Christ my King What a powerful name it is Nothing can stand against What a powerful name it is Temptation is a part of the human experience, isn't it? And Satan's going to do everything he can to get us to look away from what matters most. What winners do daily, what losers do occasionally. It's what we do from day to day that's the key, isn't it? Being in the Bible, a life group, and being an active, vital part of a local church body. Our daily diet will always become our momentary declarations. Made a decision for Christ today? or you just want to grow in your faith, we'd love to help. So take the next step, would you? Text JOURNEY to 313131. Feeling alone or feeling disconnected? Well, text LIFE GROUP to 313131. We would love to help you find a life group that's a perfect fit for you. Thanks for joining us today.